Have you noticed the cost of water going up? At Rainbow Municipal Water District and Fallbrook Public Utility District, we are working together to serve our communities. Our agencies currently buy our water from the San Diego County Water Authority. Under SDCWA, ratepayers in Fallbrook and Rainbow are paying for pipelines and facilities down south that we don't benefit from. The law that created SDCWA gives us the right to detach. And as it turns out, Fallbrook and Rainbow have connections that can be served by a different wholesaler, Eastern Municipal Water District. Eastern's cost for the same water is lower than SDCWA. We'll save money on water costs, which will provide the opportunity for Fallbrook and Rainbow to halt rate increases. And the water supply from Eastern will be just as reliable as it is from SDCWA. So we have started the process to part ways with SDCWA and begin purchasing our water from Eastern. This process is called detachment. And if approved, it will ultimately be subject to a vote of the residents of Fallbrook and Rainbow. Detachment, a reliable supply of water at a lower cost. Okay, thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce our two general managers, Jack Beebe from Fallbrook Public Utility District and Tom Kennedy from Rainbow. You need to share your screen. Uh, thank you, Noelle. I'm, I'm Jack Beebe, general manager with Fallbrook uh, Public Utility District. Uh, can everyone hear me? I'm usually fairly loud, so yeah, good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to go in a little bit more in the details. I'm going to give you a little bit of of a water uh, supply 101. Uh, explain sort of the the large bureaucracy of water, Southern California. Why something that seems simple on the surface is incredibly complicated, and we've been, as Keen Simon said, two years at it, uh, still looking another few months to work our way out the other side of it. So if you go to the next slide. So just some background um, between the two districts. So Rainbow Municipal Water District, that's the area we're in right now. Uh, it stretches out, you know, the other side of 15, Horse Creek Ranch, down to Gopher Canyon, up into Rainbow. Uh, Fallbrook Public Utility District sits up in Duluth, sort of the downtown Fallbrook area. That's where, where we are. The districts are a little different. So uh, Rainbow is a, a little larger. We, we saw if anyone could do acre to, to square mile math, but uh, Fallbrook's about 44 square miles. We're about a half of, of Rainbow service area. We're a little denser. We've got the downtown Fallbrook area uh, and Duluth, which isn't so dense. Um, you know, Rainbow, uh, less, a little less density and, and larger ag. So they're at about 65% ag. Fallbrook, um, you know, back when I started 10 plus years ago, we were close to 70%, right? So that's that's sort of showing you the scope of change that's occurred within within our service area. A lot of that's uh, some of the big ag demands up in the Duluth area and other areas. So our ag demands uh, have dropped somewhat substantially in Fallbrook. Um, the, the demographics is a little different too between the areas. Um, affordability is a big issue for everyone with water, which is why we can fill up a probably the biggest community room in Fallbrook and people are sitting here even though it's hot. Um, you know, we understand that, that the cost of water is a big issue, uh, not, not just for some of the lower income uh, residents within our service area, but it's, it's a big issue for everyone. Um, you know, significant for agriculture, but also for residential people in, in what a lot of people outside of this area don't recognize is, you know, people move here because they want larger lots and with larger lots, if you don't want to live on dirt, goes larger water use. And, and so that cost of water, when, you know, countywide people say it's $5 per customer, that impact our customers is often much higher, right? And so, you know, a meeting like this doesn't necessarily fill up in other areas if it is $5 a month. The reason is it's not $5 a month in Fallbrook and Rainbow. Those increases have been significant. And people like Tom and me that have to deal with the rate hearings, we know or just live here, right? I live in Rainbow, right? I know, right? I, you know, so that's that's the main reason we're here. So if you go to the next slide. So I'm gonna give a little bit of, of, of water 101. And so what we're looking at is sort of the, the Southern California Metropolitan Water District Service Area. So the reason Southern California is what Southern California is and why there's water is because of Metropolitan Water District. It's made up of 26 member agencies, right? So there's 26 members of Metropolitan. Metropolitan's primary job was to bring in water from Northern California and the Colorado River. That's still our primary source of water. Southern California, Northern California, Colorado River, right? So when people come here and they say, why, you know, one reason your water is expensive 
is you're paying to get that water from Northern California, Colorado River. You're paying for that infrastructure. Then you're paying Metropolitan to get the water through Metropolitan. And then here we're paying the San Diego County Water Authority. So San Diego County Water Authority at the bottom of that picture is a member of MET. Fallbrook and Rainbow are one of the two of the 24 members of the San Diego County Water Authority, right? So the bureaucracy is somewhat complicated. You write your checks to Rainbow Fallbrook. A lot of that money then goes to the San Diego County Water Authority. Some of that money then goes to Metropolitan. Some of that money then goes to pay this statewide infrastructure. So that's that's why this system is a little more complicated than a lot of other areas you'd see in the country where you just have the, the utility has a well, it distributes that water and, and that's how it gets it gets done. Um, from a water supply perspective, within the members of Met and within the members of Metropolitan, some have their own supply, some don't. And those decisions are, are what those local agencies decide in terms of how much reliability they want and what the cost is worth in that reliability. What is their makeup of their district? So some Met member agencies rely on Metropolitan. Some Met member agencies like LA, uh, DWP, Owens Valley, they have some other water that they get. Um, Fallbrook, we've, we've, it's a whole other story in itself. Um, I've had a long running water rights dispute with Camp Pendleton. If you wanna know about it, look up the Fallbrook story. It's a Frank Capra little video, um, real interesting. But the end result of that in about two to three months, we're gonna start getting half of our water locally. So that's been a 60 year battle that's finally coming to an end. So we will have some local water. Um, that will help mitigate some of the cost of water because we're in control of that. And this for Fallbrook is to deal with that other half, right? So we still got half that we're trying to deal with. Rainbow relies 100% on imported water. So this is you know, the, the, a, a big deal to deal with all their water costs. We'll go to the next slide. So, so what makes us unique? So San Diego County Water Authority, they've got um, the, these 24 member agencies um, what's to keep everyone from doing what Fallbrook and Rainbow are doing, right? If we say, hey, we want out, and then everyone says, hey, we want out too, right? Um, the difference between the two of us is we actually connect off Metropolitan's infrastructure. So the county line is not where the water authority's facilities begin. It actually begins further south, um, and you can see it up here on the map. And so what that means is Fallbrook Public Utility District actually takes all its water off Metropolitan's pipelines. Right? We don't use the pipelines in San Diego County. Um, Rainbow's in the process of basically converting so they can take all of their water off that infrastructure. And so that's really the, the big difference for us is we don't need any of the infrastructure in the county, but by being a member of the water authority, we have to pay for it. And so that's really the, the sum and bulk of our argument is that, is the way to get away from paying for that infrastructure is to basically switch wholesale suppliers from the San Diego County Water Authority to Eastern Municipal Water District. What does that mean for everyone else? It doesn't, it's a paper change, right? So it doesn't mean you're gonna see, you know, some big difference. It doesn't mean the county line changes. It just means when we send, when you send our money to us, instead of sending money to the Water Authority, we send a smaller amount of money to Eastern, right? And our rates get set based on how much it costs us to bring water. That's our biggest cost is the cost of water. So that's, that's the big change is to bring down that cost of getting water to Fallbrook. We'll go to the next one. So I'm, I'm going to give sort of a big picture summary and then I'm going to let uh, Tom get into some of the, the details. But, the, you know, one of the big drivers of this is, is what Jonathan just brought up is it's, it's this cost benefit equation. And that's what started to kind of initiate this discussion with the water authorities. Look at what are we paying? What are you paying? Right. It's not it's not us paying. It's all of you paying it through your water bills to the water authority and what are we getting back? And is that fair, right? And so that was one of the big drivers of saying, hey, this, this equation doesn't seem fair for us that don't need your infrastructure. Um, rate increases, you know, the, the only other time we get this many people is when we have our, our rate increase process. And generally in this one, people are looking for information and those are just mad at us. And so that is a um, incredibly painful process of board members, all of us um, to have to go through. And the cost of water has been going up about 8%. So if you look at unit cost of water, acre foot of water, it's gone up 8% annually, right? And you know that because you're seeing those increases on your water bill. And that's significant. When, you, when, you're, when you're 
If you were spending $20 a month on water and it went up 8%, that's not great. But here it's more than that, right? You're not spending $20 a month. You weren't 10 years ago spending $20 a month. It was $100 and now it's, you know, $200, $300. It's a big, it's a big number for a lot of people. Um, the other thing that that's happening right now is, you know, a lot of this cost of water has been on investments that have been made in San Diego County that we feel and, and you as voters would ultimately get to decide aren't worth the cost, right? The, the benefit and cost to those aren't really worth that 8% annual increase. And right now the water authority is pursuing another project, which is, I showed you this, this line metropolitan built to go to the Colorado river. They're pursuing a project just a little south of that to build the same infrastructure because they don't get along. And so it's this idea, we could build the same pipeline and get water cheaper from the Colorado River. And our boards, both Fallbrook and Rainbow, the economics that we've seen don't work. All it would guarantee is that 8% is gonna continue for the next two decades. And for our communities, that's a problem, right? The, the sustainability of our communities doesn't work if we keep having water go up 8% annually, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem. So that's one of the big drivers um, too, is we see what's happening with that. It's a $5 billion project. Um, it doesn't create new water. It would basically just create a, a pipeline that we think we could wheel cheaper than we do through Metropolitan, which we own part of by being part of uh, the, the Water Authority of Metropolitan. And as, as Keen Simons raised, um, when we formed Fall Republic Utility District was an original member of the Water Authority and, and Rainbow came in a little later. When we formed the Water Authority, we wrote the rules and we said, hey, right now this makes sense, right? Fallbrook back then, there wasn't Eastern like it is today. There was nothing, right? When Fallbrook back in the, the 40s. And we met and the, the other people around us were San Diego and we said, hey, let's come together and figure out how to get water from uh, Northern California, Colorado River. There's a water and we formed the San Diego County Water Authority. It's a partnership, joint powers authority type of thing, but it's its own entity. San Diego County Water Authority. But there's language in that act that said, hey, this is how you leave, right? So someday it may not make sense. And if you wanna leave, this is how you leave. And essentially that says, this is what you pay, right? And it's essentially if there's property tax-based payments, which there are some to the Water Authority, they keep getting those. So some of the property tax you on your bill, some of that money goes to the Water Authority. You keep making that payment and then you vote. You vote, the people in Fallbrook and Rainbow vote. And those are the rules we agree to when we form the Water Authority. Now, what LAFCO has the ability to just say is, is that fair, right? So that's really the question that's asked is, is that fair for Fallbrook and Rainbow to do that? Should we allow sort of this language to hold and, and them to leave under these conditions and vote? And that's what LAFCO essentially has to, to decide. In the end for us, we're gonna get the same water from the same sources through the same pipelines. So that water we're getting right now coming through Metropolitan, coming to us is gonna be the same supply we're gonna get after this process goes through. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tom to go into some more details. Thanks, Chad. Can you guys go to the next slide, please. And again, I'm Tom Kennedy, I'm the general manager at Rainbow. This is up Jack shorter than I am. So I want to talk a little bit about, somebody asks us all the time, they say, why now? Why didn't we do this a long time ago? This chart shows the, the price differential between the Water Authority and Metropolitan. You have to remember that Eastern charges $11 an acre foot over Metropolitan's wholesale price. That's their markup as a wholesaler. Water Authority, as you can see here, is in the $600 range for the same acre foot of water from the same pipe, same plant. And so if you go back to 1990, the difference was very small, but starting about 15 years ago, those that spread started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You all saw it in your water bills. We noticed it in our cost of bills they get to us. And so this is where uh, it became clear to us that this was unsustainable, especially as Jack mentioned, talking about spending $5 billion more on a, on a pipeline to, to try to get more water, water out of Lake Mead. I don't know if anybody's seen Lake Mead recently. It doesn't seem like a very good idea. And so we both, 18 of the 24 member agencies voted against that, but the weighted vote system uh, made it, kept it moving forward. So they're still spending your money. I know it's about $25 out of the pocket of every one of uh, Rainbow's ratepayers for just the study to try to spend $5 billion more, which is uh, something that we oppose. So 
this is the main driver that we're doing it now and why people ask, why did you do this 20 years ago? Because uh, that's why. Next slide, please. So the, um, as you all know, everyone who lives in, in Bonzel, Rainbow, Fallbrook, Duluth has seen the impact agriculture here. You know, the, the cost of water has gone up, up, up. I hear from growers pretty much, not every day, but at least every week about the challenge. And uh, there was a study done by the San Diego Food Alliance uh, a few years ago looking at the actual impact on agriculture and what's been happening. And, and you talk to the Farm Bureau, and you've all seen it, that about 10,000 acres of productive ag land has gone out, a lot of it avocado, and about a million avocado trees were taken out of service. And you see the, the stumps, we, I don't have to tell you, you see them every day. And there's also the associated losses, economic losses, job losses, whatnot. And, but while some people down south might think that's, you know, just, well, you know, that's this or that, in, in the Rainbow Service area, that's our only economic engine. You know, we don't have a downtown. We don't have even a major, Daniels, Daniels is our supermarket, but, you know, there's no auto mall, there's no nothing here. That's what this economy runs on. And so it affects the local character of our community, our neighborhoods, and it also affects property values. And, and another thing is that those trees are out there actively sucking up carbon from I-15. And the calculations they made, that, that those that been there, we would have taken out about 325,000 metric tons of carbon out of, the, out of the atmosphere. This is something that's important. And you have to realize some of the decision makers that are gonna be considering this stuff live down in the urban areas where that stuff is more important to them than the avocados just for the sake of avocados. They wanna talk about carbon, which is super important. But what we're telling them is that the cost of water here is a threat to the air quality as well, because those trees were doing a good job of taking carbon out of the air from all those cars on I-15 and turning it into guacamole. So next slide, please. So there's, a, there's been a lot of discussion, and, and I'll go through some of the, the challenges the water authorities made to the situation uh, so far. Um, and one of their big things is that, you know, we're reneging and we're leaving everybody else behind. And uh, recently, the consultant working for LAFCO did an economic analysis of what the actual impact of our detachment is, whether how much, how much their, their expenses went down and how much their revenue went down. And it turns out, and this is still a draft, so he hasn't completed it yet, but the Dr. Hanneman, when you look at his numbers, it's a little over 1% total reduction on the Water Authority's annual budget, that their revenue is gonna go down 1%. But the funny thing is that that's less than their year-to-year -year variability of their rates, of their, of their budget. So if you look at their budget, and they're actual every year. Sometimes it's up three or four percent. Sometimes it's down ten percent. Up two or three. Down two or three. Our detachment is in within the error range of their ability to predict their revenue any given year. And so, by kind of definition, it's a de minimis impact that uh, that one percent rate increase one time would cover all the cost of our detachment. We've suffered through much larger rate increases for decades, and that's a problem. And it will only have a minimal financial impact, as Jonathan Rivas analyzed, and as the numbers that uh, I'm sure LAFCO's consultant will conclude will be the same. It's about 50 cents a month per meter for folks down south. And if you look at places like National City and Chula Vista, uh, it's even less, it's a quarter a month. So while there may be this gloom and doom on how the folks up here, if they vote to leave, are gonna you know, stick somebody else with a bill, it's really not the case. The reality is that we've been stuck with a bill for a long time. And as Jack also mentioned, this can't lead to other people leaving. Uh, the only people who can take water off of METS pipelines are Fallbrook and Rainbow, no other agency. The closest one would be Valley Center, but they've sent LAFCO probably five or six letters over the last several months saying, no, we're not, it's too far, and it's too expensive for them to build the infrastructure that we already, that you already paid for, that we own. So next slide. So, the, the, one of the things that uh, uh, Keen had indicated is that we're looking at the water reliability question and that Eastern has done their urban water management planning, Metropolitan have all the way in saying, yes, we can supply the water. The reality is they're supplying the water now, right? And so we're just, it's the same water, same plant. Um, and the LAFCO analysis that uh, Dr. Hanneman done, his draft analysis indicated that he took the worst case stress test to where let's say in the future, supplies go way down, but demands go way up. Now that's not how it's been going, but let's say it happens. What he found is that we're equally reliable, whether we're on, on Eastern or the Water Authority, we're both reliant on MET at that point, right? I mean, we're all in this together. So there's no difference in reliability. And then now with the Santa Margarita project coming on, Fallbrook to have local supply, which will uh, reduce their reliance. Rainbow and Fall also have a payment in the 
of some big emergency or earthquake that we'll share the supplies for the week or two that we need to get everything sorted out. And this also improves reliability for the people down south. Now, they're talking about reliability in ways that are different than we do. If you're an agricultural economy, you look at reliability in a different way than if you're biotech or tourism or a big urban, if you're Qualcomm, right? Reliability here comes, if it comes at a cost that puts you out of business, doesn't do you any good. If your grove is dead, it doesn't make a difference if the, if the, if the water is reliable or not, because you can't afford it. And so it's a different equation that sometimes it's hard for the urban folks to understand the, the price reliability equation that's different up here. But for that 1%, when we, when we detach, there's 20,000 acre feet a year that they're going to have extra that they won't have to supply, that all the investment, that we, they may go even further. And so that's something we hope that Dr. Hanneman will look at the benefits of us leaving to improve reliability for others. And I think that the other thing about reliability that's important to note, and, it, and it's codified in LAFCO procedures, is the, the question of what's reliable enough. You know, we don't have to be the most reliable supply ever in the world. We need to have a, a reliability that's, that matches the, the price you all want to pay for what level of reliability. I could get you way better reliability and raise your rates three or four times, but that's not going to work out. We have to look at what's reliable enough. And that choice, according to LAFCO policies, should be made at the local level. Folks like you giving advice to us in meetings like this and through our board members to say, this is the kind of reliability we want, and this is the price we're willing to pay for it. So next slide. So as uh, the uh, LAFCO process that uh, Keynes so ably went through, we made our application, formal application in March of last year. We have LAFCO ad hoc committee that's studying it along with Dr. Hanman, the consultant for LAFCO. We're hoping we'll have hearings by the end of this year, Priscilla, we'll see, we'll see, that's what we're hoping. And then should LAFCO approve it, it'll go to an election. We really wanna hit the June 22 primary because we don't want to have to pay for a special election that's expensive to run special elections and it's and but we don't want to have this thing drag on to the november uh general election because you know the, the every month we're still in is about eight hundred thousand dollars more that has to come out of your pockets to go down to the water authority that won't when we go to easter so we want to get this thing done one way or the other um and get it done so next slide so I'll go through some of the, the Water Authority's responses because they, they, they have done a few things. Uh, well, I think the first thing they did after I met with their board chair is we got a public record jack request to search through all our emails and see what we've been up to. So, but that's part for the course in these things. And then their, their board uh, passed a resolution, kicked Jack and I out of the boardroom uh, and passed a resolution that, that they're worried that our actions will harm the customers of Fallbrook and Rainbow and they don't want to make sure it won't raise anyone else's bill anywhere else, and it won't impact the environment negatively, and that uh, they won't lose their voting power at MET, and that uh, they also pushed real hard to do a countywide vote so that the vote to detach would be held countywide, which of course with the, our small population would be a tough one, but the state law is very clear on where the vote should be taken. So. I think that's a dead letter on the, on the um, and it won't go through. They also started a new campaign on a website called Stronger Together, which I think was a veiled uh, influence uh, that, that we should be staying with the Water Authority will be stronger that way. And that'll be up to you guys to determine at some point, we hope. So next next slide. So so I'm gonna go through some of the arguments. You know, they're saying that they, they, they say in their, uh, one of their uh, op-eds and some of the other materials they put out, they're worried that if we go to Eastern, will be more exposed to Metropolitan's big rate increases. Well, Metropolitan's the basis of all of our rates here because they deliver all the water. And if you saw the slide I showed you before between the Water Authority's price and Met's price, there have to be some really big changes for that to occur because what we want to do is Metropolitan's the main wholesaler. We want to find a middleman with as little overhead as possible. $11 an acre foot is about as little as you're going to get because with Eastern, we're not using their facilities. We don't have to touch any of their pipelines. We don't have to touch the water authority's pipelines, but we're paying for them all the way to the border. And so that's one of the challenges. And then so they also wanna make sure detachment doesn't increase water rates elsewhere. Well, the law doesn't say that. The law talks about what our obligations are, should we detach? It talks about if there's bonded indebtedness to build a treatment plant or something like that that's on your property tax bill. A lot of you folks here in Bonds will remember when the school, the high school district separated from Fallbrook. Right, that's what 2010, 2012, 
there was a property tax on the for the Fallbrook, a bond from Fallbrook High School District that got paid for by people in Boswell, even after the separation of the school districts, I think for four or five years until it was retired. That's exactly what state law provides for. Had the Water Authority uh, put, a, put a bond out that, that, that we agreed with that was still outstanding, you'd have to pay that. But that doesn't provide for these other exit fee concepts that are in the law. We expect that once LAFCO goes through this and they see the very de minimis financial impact of the Water Authority where our 1% impact is less than their ability to pick every year how much, how much revenue they're gonna have, we'll find that, the, that there's no need for any exit fee. But there's, um, the, other, the other problem is that it's up to you to figure out where you want to be your wholesaler, not, not the water authority. They don't, uh, as you saw either, the, the, the detachment won't increase rates ridiculously elsewhere. You've all been paying way more than your fair share for decades, and it's time for that subsidy to end. Next time. One of the interesting arguments is the Water Authority has proposed that our detachment sometime, somehow will influence the environment in the San Joaquin, Sacramento River Bay Delta area, that somehow will increase demand there. And the thing about it is, is that the blend of water that's in Lake Skinner that comes to us here isn't determined by the Water Authority, it's determined by metropolitan and by regional availability, whether it's a wet or dry year in the Sierras or a wet or dry year out in the Lake Mead. So there's the, the water we will get will be the same water either way, either way with Water Authority or with MET. And so there's exact, exactly zero impact there. They're still making that argument. It's a, it's a funny one. The best one I think, or worst, depending on your, your, your thought, is they don't want to lose voting power at Metropolitan. They have a, a big thing and they don't want to lose their voting power. Well, the Water Authority has about 17.44% of the vote at Metropolitan now. If we detach, it goes down to 17.21, a 0.23% reduction. The thing that is wrong about the way they look at it is that Metropolitan's voting structure is based on property values, assessed valuation in each service area. Well, last time I checked, that property value is your property value. It's not their property value. The landowners hold the property value, and the landowner's property value should go where the landowner wants that vote to go. So if all you collectively want to take these 0.23% and move it to Eastern, that should be up to you, not to them to say you can't take it, because it's not theirs, that's yours. The people hold that property, the people should hold that, that right to vote. And so the countywide vote, uh, I think I already indicated the law is very clear. Uh, that one of the things the countywide vote is they knew if we had to do a countywide vote, that'd be a really expensive vote. It'd be millions of dollars to run a countywide vote here. But uh, uh, it's not on the table right now. I don't believe that LAFCO is going to buy off on that argument because the state law is very clear in this. And so um, we want to make sure that uh, you folks are the ones who make this decision. It's an important decision. And we want you to make it. So next one. So in a summary, this is about fairness. This is about us paying the true cost of our water and not subsidizing, as Jonathan indicated earlier, folks down south. We're, we're paying, there's a big project down in Mission Trails right now, build, building a big reservoir. You guys are rainbow customers, we're paying 4% of the cost of that reservoir. We'll never use it or benefit from it, but we dutifully pay for it. And the cost of water authority has been going up, as I showed earlier, at a, at a ridiculous rate. And based on what we see at the water authority now, we don't expect that to go down anytime soon. Uh, yeah, MET will raise their rates in the future. That, that will happen. But we don't need an extra middleman raising them even more for us. And then for Rainbow, you know, I hear from, you know, some of you probably use uh, Frank Wollum of Wollum Grove Management, who does a lot of grows around here, and some of the other growers uh, call me all the time saying, we got to do something. We can't, we can't sustain this level of rate increase. We're just going to have no avocado production or other things going on here. We need, to, we need to really work on holding the line and doing that because one of the, and I was telling someone in the back here earlier, right now there's millions of dollars coming out of your pockets and going to build pipelines and infrastructure that are down in San Diego or Kearney Mesa or National City or El Cajon. You've all, too many of you have seen main breaks on your street or around the corner from you where we've got a lot of old high pressure mains here. That money needs to stay here locally to help fix those pipes, not fix pipes down there. That money that comes out of your pockets that we can't use locally, we have to send down south, will be freed up by detachment to make sure we can maintain the infrastructure that's in our streets, in our neighborhoods, in our communities right now. So that's a really important thing. That's, 
you know, seven to ten million dollars a year is a lot of money that we could put invest here. And depending on how all things work out, it's it's likely we can even reduce rates. I'm not on rainbow if, if this detachment happens soon and our, our board budget has forecast, we can start reducing rates a little bit. But we're not, we really need some of that money to put in the ground here as well. And and finally, there's no real big impact. The disaster on everybody down south isn't gonna happen. We're talking 50 cents a month. So next slide. And so Oh, go ahead, next one after that. No, we don't want to, we're not going to show that. Just go to the next slide. Sorry. The, as as uh, Jennifer and Hayden indicated, the fact that uh, this was in an op-ed in the uh, Voice of San Diego a couple of weeks ago, the fact is our rate payers are paying far more for their water than they should. It's not right, and it needs to end. And so that's that is a uh, that's the message we're putting out here today and we would love to get your questions i know there's got to be a few out there noel will go around with the with the microphone and so we have people who are watching oh. this over youtube and zoom and so if you have a question i'm going to come around and hold the microphone so those people watching online can also hear you and we'll alternate back and forth hi i'm uh, howard lewis i live up in sycamore ranch and i would first of all want to thank all of you for presenting what I consider a very well-prepared presentation. In fact, some of my questions here that I wanted to ask you, I think, uh, uh, Tom, you, you answered a big one, what's the opposition? Because I maintain to understand something, I have three levels. Number one is, do I think I understand it? Number two, can I explain it to somebody else? And number three, what's the opposition? So back to, can I explain it to somebody else? My question is, if I want to review this, has this been recorded, or what would you recommend for me if I want to go back over what you have here today? Yeah, we were we were having some audio issues in the beginning, so we'll see what we end up with recording. Um, everything except the first twenty minutes. We have everything but the first twenty minutes. Yes. So we got the recording. Sorry, Keen. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, that was the best part. You won't be able to hear the "I Had the Tiger" intro. <laughs> it's on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, the, the other thing to note is, is on both our websites, so, you know, Fallbrook Public Utility District, it's www.fpud.com. There's a whole page uh, set to this, um, you know, information on it. Uh, same with, I believe, Rainbow's got the same thing. Also, LAFCO, um, uh, Keen Simons, they have, they have every document that's gone back and forth, so if you really want to get in the weeds on this, uh, you know, San Diego LAFCO has everything that went back and forth if you just want to see you know all the correspondence so all that's all that's out there the video that we showed that kind of short videos you know that's on on our website and and fallbrooks to get to people and if you want other information you can always always go to noel do you have anyone um with a question online yes we yes. have uh Pris priscilla reinholz do you want to read it um Priscilla says it's an excellent analysis. We just need to know what we can do as citizens to push this agenda. You know, that's a good question. Right now, it's really just kind of stay informed. Um, this won't come to the commission at LAFCO uh, for public comment until they, the staff produces the report, at which point it will be made public. Um, at that point, anybody who's interested can provide uh, commentary. At some point, there will be a hearing at the commission, uh, which hopefully by that time will be all in person, and and you'll be able to uh, go down there and speak uh, at the commission hearing itself. But that is probably a couple months out. A couple of questions about the Santa Margarita River project. Number one, can you give us just a brief overview of the project? That's number one. Number two, how will it affect the environment down there where many of us use the sand maker, horse riding, just playing, picnicking, et cetera? How will it affect that? And will the people in Rainbow uh, have any access to that water? Uh, those are great questions, Rod. And, and he, did, he didn't plant those, even though he, Rod lives in the same neighborhood I do. But um, so Fallbrook, uh, Santa Margarita River property. So part of that project, that one of the, the main parts of that was to permanently preserve the Santa Margarita River property. So we're off in a little bit, I'll keep it short tangent, but that property was originally acquired by Fallbrook Public Utility District to flood, right? Originally, that was gonna be a reservoir. So that's why there's like, uh, you know, list, uh, uh, Vista Lago, Vista Del Lago, right? You wonder why there's Vista Del Lago in Fallbrook. 
it's because it wasn't going to be a lake. So part of this project permanently preserved it. While we, we sold it to the Wildlands Conservancy, nonprofit group, guaranteed trail access, equestrian use, because there's a lot of equestrian people that use it. That was all a big part of that to guarantee that. So nothing's going to change down there. The water is actually being taken off the river down in Camp Pendleton. So Camp Pendleton gets about all its water from the Santa Margarita River on Camp Pendleton. That's why they built the base there. This is just expanding those facilities down on Camp Pendleton to take the water off the river in high rain events, recharge into the ground, get back to Fallbrook. And so that's, there's nothing that's gonna change. Um, it actually guarantees water in the river. So some of the water you see in the river is actually water released upstream to deal with water rights issues. So it's all it's all going to be the same. So that that's the positive. No negatives. You're not going to see any changes in that property use of it. For Rainbow Residents, we we do. So one of the the good benefits of that project is if there is a, a big emergency and you know pipelines get severed or or other things, um, we now have a supply that can feed us locally um, from from the base, that, that's a fairly sizable water supply. So we do have an agreement with Rainbow that in emergency, we'll work together, right? And make sure we're not stranding, uh, you know, we're out watering our yards in Fallbrook in a major emergency and people in Rainbow can't use water in their house. So we do have an agreement to make sure we're supporting each other and leveraging um, that project in an emergency. We're also looking at other ways to increase the yield of that project um, using recycled water and other supplies and then potentially partnering with Rainbow in, in do, doing something on those supplies. So it, it builds on facilities that allow us to, to get additional water. Do you have another question from no? Okay. First of all, I want to say, excuse me, you can stand on your foot. Uh, Thank you, supervisors and uh, directors, for doing what you do in regards to what we're trying to do to do this. You're very brave men uh, for doing this. I wanted to know a couple of different things. Is uh, Where is our county supervisor in this process? You know, Jim Desmond sits on LAFCO as our county supervisors. Um, he, you know, obviously has to wait to see the full proposal before he can weigh in one way or another. I think he understands uh, that this is part of his district and that um you know we hope he's uh listening to the concerns of folks here but i think for right now since he also sits on the lafco commission it would be premature for him to weigh in one way or another was that correct keen that's correct as as with as with uh, mr vanderlin over there as well who's a local person here but he has a, a responsibility as a commissioner to wait until he sees all the data before making his mind up um lafco are you guys an influencer or a decision maker in regard to this process? Decision maker. Okay. And um, to our to our board, are you concerned about any type of Chinatown reprisal against you and our people? I, I don't. I, I don't think so. I hope not. Okay. But uh, no, it's. It is difficult. Um, we've become kind of persona non grata. Jack and I both serve on the board at the Water Authority, and uh, let's say there's not a lot of rungs on the ladder lower than where we inhabit down there. That's a good place to leave. <laughs> are the rates for Fallbrook and Rainbow the same, or are they different? We don't have the exact same rates. There's different cost structures that, with each agency. They're pretty similar. There, there are some, you know. Uh, uh, Which one's higher? You know, it really depends because there are certain rate structures, like we have different ag rates and different residential rates that vary than Fallbrook does because Fallbrook does have a more urban core. And so there's no one rate that's the same for anybody because it depends on how you use water, what size meter you have, whether you use five units a month or 500 units a month or 5,000 units a month. That's how you determine. So if you took somebody with the exact same classifications, then you could do a comparison. But there's some that are higher, some that are lower for each of us. And, and, and just to give you a sense, if, if nothing changes over time, Fallbrook's rates will end up lower than, if we don't, if this doesn't happen, we'll end up lower than Rainbow's. And, and I'd like to say it's because Fallbrook will be much more efficient and we're better run. But the reality is our cost of water, because we're gonna have local water, will be less. And that's the big driver. So, you know, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, both Tom and I are take, you know, sort of, cost efficiency very serious isn't important, but if, if we fired 20% of our people, right, you could, we still couldn't pass through a significant 
reduction in water costs because the cost of water is such a big part of our budget. And that's why if we're able to lower that, you know, we're actually able to talk about something like a water cost reduction, which is something, you know, probably within the history of both districts, we haven't been able to do. So that's, that's really one of the, the big differences. I have a question for LAVCO. Uh, since you're the decision maker, do you also set the rates that San Diego charges Fallbrook and Rainbow? No. So you have no control over what they're charging us, but you're going to make a decision whether or not we can leave. Correct. The other question is, is that you said you have an ad hoc committee. When you say ad hoc, it doesn't seem like it is too serious to you. Well, I, I'll describe that for you, Kinsley. You know, the, uh, what the, uh, Commissioner Jacobs set out when she was board chair or LAPCO chair last year was to try to get us all in a room to work out any differences the water already have in us. And so that was a great idea. We were fully supportive of it. Then it started growing and the water authority wanted to add a bunch of people. So now we've got people from the county, people from uh, representing the city, the couple of the different cities, a couple of people in the water. There. There's 12 people on this ad hoc committee now. And it's been going on now for over a year uh, in meetings. Um, I The one process part about it, even though it's taking way longer, is that uh, uh, Keen hired a, a person named uh, Dr. Hanneman who's studying these things. He's not from around here. He actually works at Arizona State University, but he's very knowledgeable on water topics. He thinks things a little differently than the Water Authority or Rainbow or Fallbrook does, but when we're looking at his analysis, they've been generally fair. And the one thing that we know about, and this is one reason our board has confidence, is the facts that are in our favor here. The law and the facts are in our favor here. So if, if he does a, a clear-eyed analysis of the situation, we believe he's gonna come up with a result that will be generally acceptable to us. Uh, one more question. Um, uh, back to the rate thing between Fallbrook yeah. and, and uh, Rainbow. If you have a Fallbrook address, then why are you on Rainbow Water? Yeah, well, see, that's an interesting thing. You know, this is all unincorporated county areas. And when these boundaries were done by the, we were set up in 1954, they were in, well, 1923, and then on the Water Authority in the 40s. That was pre-LAFCO days, but LAFCO has managed those boundaries. We do, uh, every now and then, we just did one recently where we'll take a parcel that, hey, this should be in Fallbrook and we'll, because they can serve them. But how boundaries were drawn eons ago, uh, uh, you know, it's a long story, but yeah, look at school this The thing to remember is in California, when people first got here, the first thing they needed was water. So that's Fallbrook Public Utility District. We're going to be 100 years next year. We're going to have, a, I'm going to plug our 100 year anniversary celebration that we're going to have um, next summer. So that was one of the first things they formed. And it just had to do with where people lived around Fallbrook at that time set our boundaries, how we grew, how our service grew, how, you know, Rainbow Municipal Water District that serves Bonzel, well, because it served, you know, primarily what was Rainbow initially. So it's just, that's why there's so many different water districts within Southern California, because they predate government in a lot of time. People didn't want government, they wanted water. And so that's what they had to do. Still do. Still do. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have a question for, for Keith. Uh, about LAFCO, uh, I, I've seen in the uh, in the press and various and sundry documents. As a matter of fact, it came up again tonight. Uh, using the analogy of Fulbrook and Rainbow leaving uh, as a divorce, and therefore you have to settle up. But what's interesting to me about start talking about how are they going to pay us back for the 49 million dollars we paid them over the last 10 years and now, I, I don't mean that to be facetious i believe that that has to be part and parcel of lafco's decision on how this separation occurs well uh, point taken i would just simply offer the the uh, added context that if you are leaving your partner in a marriage typically uh you do not necessarily get to dictate to the divorce uh, uh judge what you will take uh, uh without some kind of mediation process 
uh, as you walk out the door. Uh, LAFCO is in this format, in this proposals, somewhat uh, of a divorce court judge. Uh, there was a question earlier about, well, we, we oversee the boundaries, but we don't set rates. Well, that's appropriate. Uh, LAFCO, and Jack hit upon this, is uh, statutorily vested in, do the boundaries make sense? Are they sustainable? And are they fair? Uh, whether or not Fallbrook and Rainbow are owed money from uh, the Water Authority, maybe that's true. Uh, but I would suggest, I don't know, but I would suggest the Commission would not go down uh, the route too far of uh, allowing these two districts to leave and then telling uh, the uh, widowed uh, Water Authority, and you're going to pay uh, for them to leave you. I, I don't think that's realistic. But the point is, is to, well, again, I, you know, I, the point is taken, but I, I don't think the commission or the statutes are set up to, uh, to contemplate that type of reverse uh, reconcile. Yeah, and Charlie, just to, to go into that a little deeper, um, the County Water Authority Act prescribes the nature of what has to happen on the way out. There's no mention of us getting able to recoup anything. We just want to have a discussion on what we're required to pay on the way out, which is very small. Who's got the microphone? I don't know who's got the conch. I have a question. Oh. Uh, let me start off by quoting, I think it was Mark Twain, that said, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting. And in that, uh, with that in mind, how are you going to pay for the fight that's going to happen needing lawyers and uh, experts. What's yeah. your budget and who's going to pay for it? And how it's yeah, going well, to be Yeah, I mean, the rate payer, the board of directors looks at any potential opportunity to save a lot of money and looks at the investment it's going to take to get there. And we looked at it as, my board looked at it as being the future of our community here and trying to do what we can to preserve water costs is worth making the investment. We're spending probably a couple hundred grand a year on our lawyers and whatnot to do this thing. And the Water Authority put up a million. If they, if, we, if they would just sit in a room with us and sit down like normal people and hash this dang thing out, we could probably find a compromise, but they're a very litigious group, as you probably read in the paper with their fight with Met for the last, I don't know how many decades. And so, uh, yeah, it is an investment. It's an investment that the boards of our agencies are making for the future of, this, of these agencies. I don't, I don't know who's got the column punch over there. My name is John Hemphill. Before my wife and I moved down here six and a half years ago, we lived in Napa County for 36 years, which had an annual rainfall of 40 inches. Quite a change coming here to Wanzel. Everybody hear me? Talk a little louder. Can you hear me now? It was quite a change to come here to Bonzel with an average rainfall of about 10.35 inches. My perception after all I've seen in the last six and a half years is both water districts are pretty well managed, <clears throat> but we are in a long-term drought. The last extremely heavy rainfall year would be about 2011, based on the excellent display, which I invite all of you to see in Balboa Park in the Ruben Fleet Theater building. There's a List of annual rainfall of all 58 counties in California starting in 1905. For anyone interested in meteorology or hydrology, I invite you to see that display. So my perception is we're in about a 10th year of a long-term drought. We can hope that there's several heavy rainfall years, but I invite the county to do some long-term research and decide if there's a better prospect of more rainfall in Northern California or more rainfall in Wyoming, Colorado, the headwaters of, the, of Lake Mead, and base your decisions partly on that, as well as all of our collective input, whether that's pro or con. Thank you for the research already done. And, 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 and just to, to know one of the things that, um, you know, helps with that and then sort of the combination supply. So metropolitan system has the availability to capture both the Colorado River and the, the Northern California supplies. And, and I agree that's becoming more important is to make sure 
in big events, be it you know Northern California and it's dry in Colorado River that we're getting that water or vice versa. This is a little unusual in which it's dry everywhere, right? Colorado River, Northern California. And the benefit for Fallbrook Public Utility District is our project is then local. So all those things don't necessarily line up. Sometimes it's wet here, but it's dry in Colorado River and, and dry up in Northern California. Right now, we don't get the benefit of that from a water supply perspective. In the future, we basically have that combination, local supplies, Northern California and Colorado River to deal with sort of the hydrological variability. Washington doesn't make it down here. So there, there, there was one day a study which is sort of on the same level of regional conveyance to bring a pipeline down the Pacific coast underwater. The Bureau of Reclamation did, that didn't pencil out, so. But. At the end of the day, if we get to vote, if we get the opportunity to vote, it happens only because LAFCO uh, is in alignment with what is fair. And we don't know LAFCO, and, uh, and therefore without the knowledge of LAFCO and the makeup of the board, um, there can be a concern that could be, be political influence. Like what's going to be the why, what's going to be the political pressure of the why you would agree to this happening uh, for us? What? Yeah, that's why, you know, the makeup, can you just address a little bit of the makeup of LAFCO and uh, who, who's on there, who they represent, uh, so we can understand that this will be a very fair process. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, LAFCO, by way of state statute, is comprised of eight voting members. Two of those voting members, and this is prescribed uh, under state law, uh, our county supervisors. Uh, it happens to be Jim Desmond and uh, Nora Vargas right now. Uh, then there are two uh, council members uh, from one of the 17 cities excluding San Diego. Uh, and that happens to be Mary Salas with Chula Vista uh, and uh, Paul McNamara from Escondido. So now we're at four. Uh, then there are two special district members uh, that the 60 or so independent special districts, Fallbrook and Rainbow are two of them, get to vote on. Uh, and those two voting members is Joe McKenzie from Vista Irrigation and Barry Willis from Alpine Fire. So now we've got to six. We have one public member that the others all select, and that is Chairman uh, Andy Vanderlyn sitting over there. And then the eighth and final member, and this is because uh, of special uh, statute, uh, is dedicated to a member of the city council that the mayor of the city, uh, excuse me, uh, city council member for the city of San Diego that the mayor selects, and that is currently Chris Kate. Those are the eight voting members of LAFCO. Therefore, you see my concern that I'm bringing up, that these are not people from up here, and they have people of their own political interests, or whatever interests, and I don't know what the interests are. To be honest, I don't know. One of the interests of them, where they've got people speaking in their ear from their districts down there. Yeah, so so the, the sort of the important point of this is, you know, Tom and I can't tell you how you should, you know, feel and engage in this, but this is going to su succeed or fail. If people are for it, um, that voice is going to be important. So if, if the people here are for this, support it, that voice is important. If you're against it, it's the same thing. So there is a public hearing, and, and the people that are on LAFCO um, generally want to do what is in the public interest. And so I think that's the important thing is that the public is out there voicing what their opinion is, either for it or against it. It's going to be an important part of this process. And that's why we're several months out from that, but we're starting to make sure people are aware of it, get educated on it, and are able to figure out how to participate. So there, well, there, there is a, a signing just so if people want information when you came in, there was a signing just so that we're able to provide you, you know, sort of information so you can make up your decisions on it. Can we have an online question now and I'll get to you and you. Uh, Mr. William Kennedy said, uh, what are your future water supplies for agriculture and what are the opportunities for developing water storage? I think that there's a, 
you know, Fallbrook has been developing the Santa Margarita project for the last 50 years. Rainbow, we're working on a groundwater project here. There's very limited groundwater here in the San Luis Rey Valley, a small project we're working on developing. It's going to be a few years out before I even mean, guess their water rights are, are difficult to come by. Um, and so we're all working to try to find that. I think the biggest future source of water is going to be in reuse. Um, and so the, the state is changing the regulations to make uh, potable reuse of, of our, our reclaimed water easier and cheaper, but that's still out in the future. As far as desal water. desal water is about almost $3,000 an acre foot. And so uh, right now, when you're showing those charts, you know, water authority water is at 1,700, METS at about 1,100, desal is about 3,000. That's part of the reason the water authority water is so high. I would love for desal costs to come down. I think that 50 years from now, technology will get there, but right now it's really expensive. Plus you gotta spend 20 years in court you know, fighting the lawsuits. And so it's um, it, it's probably our, where our grandchildren will be using water from because Lake Mead might be empty by then. But uh, right now it's just not cost effective. What about new resources in the state? You know, as far as statewide storage, right, you know, there are uh, several reservoirs up in the Northern California area or the Central Valley sites, Temperance Flats, that have been on the books for a long time. We've been encouraged them to build them from Southern California, everywhere else. There's a lot of opposition to these. They're not damming rivers, they're off stream reservoirs. I think that as you find with climate change occurring, you're gonna see uh, heavier, wetter winters, with less snow, more rain. It's all gonna come at once with more flooding and that's the time you need to store it. I think it's a, the wise thing to do, but those decisions aren't made at our level. My name's Art Watson. I just wanna know I saw that percentage of 8% and going to be going up yearly. What your cost analysis will be giving to us? Would that be going down? Well, the question we had to do about, uh, I assume, if, if the attachment goes through, will your costs go down, right? As I mentioned before, a lot of the investments need to be made in the infrastructure here locally. I have already heard you a main break on their blocker. If you haven't, just wait for it. It's coming. Um, the, uh, but at Rainbow, I can't speak for Fallbrook and our, our most recent uh, five-year financial forecast shows that if we can detach, we can start reducing rates by two or three percent a year for the, uh, out through the five-year window. Now, that depends on the detachment going through without a whole bunch of extra cost and exit fee, because uh, we, we believe that's not required. And it also assumes it happens in a timely manner. If this thing drags on for four or five more years, we're still going to be subject to water authority rate increases that we'd like to avoid. A couple of questions. My name is Garrett White, resident of Fallbrook. Uh, the point of connection on the MWD line, that will not change, so therefore we won't have to do anything there. No capital improvement projects needed there. Uh, since we already get our water technically from EMWD, is there really a need to have SDCWA involved? Uh, another question. Um, I think we've answered most of those. Raw water, will that be available for us? And is there any thought of building a treatment facility in the area to help reduce costs? And I believe the other questions have been answered. All right. Okay. Yeah, sounds, thank you. So um, the only way we can get water without getting it through the, um, paying the water authority for it, even though we use METS infrastructure, is to switch our wholesale supplier. So uh, back in the day, I don't know, uh, 20 years ago, a number of North County agencies actually looked at becoming their own metropolitan member agency because there were some others that felt like they were paying more than they should have too. That, as hard as this process is, that's a whole next level of, of impossible. So, you know, th this is hard enough. Trying to become a direct met member agency is 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 impossible. So that's that's why the the path for us to be able to do essentially what you're talking about is to move from the water authority to Eastern, which just has us pay a smaller fee to Eastern to basically bring that water through. Um, the raw water economics doesn't pencil out. So the cost of building a treatment plant, the cost of raw water is pretty expensive. It's that source of supply that's a lot, not the treatment cost. It's getting the water. So the economics doesn't work, especially for Fallbrook and Rainbow that have high summer demands, low winter demands, and you can't base load a facility. Hi, uh, Jim Yeager. here. Uh, assuming LAFCO makes the right decision uh, to give us cheaper bills in the future, uh, are, do you have any concerns? Um, well, do you know what we all want? 
is there any way you can give us a unofficial poll so when it comes to the voting time and it fails uh, you know, those voter fraud happens so is there any way you can basically counter you see where i'm going with this you need to know what what our position is how do you know that I, I have a, a great deal of faith in the uh, registrar of voters to uh, conduct a, an appropriate election here in San Diego County. So what will essentially come down to, depending on whatever conditions that LAFCO puts on, and we hope they're essentially zero, is that you know there'll be two options. One, stay where you are now and continue having these rate increases, and, and another, to see those rates either stop or go down. And so we think it's a pretty easy call, at least I haven't found anybody who said no, I want my rates to keep going up 8% a year forever. <laughs> so so I, it just hasn't, we haven't seen any real opposition other than by uh, paid consultants of the water fund. Okay, to make sure I understand it, LAFCO is not gonna make a decision to give us cheaper rates or not. They may give us permission to have a vote or they may not. If they do give us the permission, then it's just our two areas voting, but it's not the whole county. Do I understand that correctly, sir? Hi there. <laughs> uh, I have so many questions, but I guess the most important one is that we've been uh, for a few years now, especially um, if you compare FPUD and Rainbow, and I'm so glad you guys are playing nice in the sandbox. Maybe you can merge and, and fire half the staff again. We spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on that whole, whole ordeal. However, I know, look at you, Tom. I'm going, I wish they wouldn't give her the bike. But my, my question is, when you say um, you're kind of making it into one group, FPUD and Rainbow, they're very different. And for me, um, over the years, one big difference is that we rely more on San Diego County Water Authority, especially 7 to 10% of our water comes from the desal plant. So when we say we have zero, zero infrastructure from them and zero pipeline well rainbow's been working on you know this pipeline for a while and we have been paying for it we're going to continue to pay for it so it's not a new cost center it's one that already exists as well as the lawyers and the consultants that spoke today um and all of that so my point being i guess my question to you tom is when you say zero and zero infrastructure and we've had zero benefit as rainbow forget fpud i don't think i think you might have a little bit different answer well i, I think that if, if if you get the full study in it and the linda motor studies on lafco's web right, sdlafco.org it doesn't say for rainbow zero right fallbrook zero rainbow uh in our southern service area so if you're south of south of here going down to gopher canyon we still use some of the water through these connections mainly to serve the higher elevations along where you see our tanks that are up above. Uh, if you drive up to West Lilac, uh, up toward 395, you see the tank on the top there. There's the, the Hutton, the Turner, Gopher tanks down there. And that's it. those are ones that we can't reach from our MET connection. Now we're about to build pump stations that will get that water there. Those are finishing design will be built pretty soon. We were gonna wait to build and adopt a detachment, but the Water Authority just raised the transportation rate by 24% starting in January 1. That means we gotta start building those things faster because it's uh, it's very expensive water. So um, we can run without it. Right now, we are not, other than to keep those couple of tanks with a little well, extra water in them, we're running all of our water off the MET connection. We're about 70% of our water is running off MET now. It's just in a very southern service area. Fallbrook is 100% off of water authority pipelines. I'm not, they're 100% off the, well, they're, you're off of the water authority. You're on MET, yeah. What about the desal? So desal water doesn't come up in this north. We see a very little bit of it, only in very low demand periods, burp up to maybe go for Canyon Road. And so, yeah, don't stand next to me. Um, it, we don't see the benefit from it for the cost. So it's really, if you want to have $3,000 an acre foot water, okay, then that'll be up to the ratepayers to say, and the voters to say, yes, let's stay with the water authority. Let's, let's roll. I think there's more. Oh, yeah. We have another online. Um, what is the current timeline assumption for the break from uh, the water authority? So that really depends on the LACO process. Uh, I, we believe it should come to the commission sometime for the end of the year, early next year, maybe maybe September this year, but I don't think Keen's going to say that. No. So we expect it to be toward the end of this year, early next year. At that point, there'll be a series of hearings um, and then a vote by the commission. 
Uh, should it go away, the commission has another reconsideration period where the, the uh, there takes another month or so to go through. And at that point, it would be put on the ballot. We want this process to be done by the latest March of 2022, because that's the date we need to get the data to the registrar to get on the June ballot. Any later than that, we get pushed to November. And after that election would be completed, there, once the, the registrar completes the tallying, which seems to take longer and longer every year these, these years, then that once that certified election goes to LAFCO, they will finalize the process and then hold another hearing and then away we go. Yeah, just to uh, drill down on this idea of an election. So should LAFCO approve uh, with or without conditions uh, one or both of these proposals? Keep in mind, there are two proposals. So that means at a minimum, there are two uh, separate elections, right? So it is, let's just play the scenario out. LAFCO says yes. The question goes to Fallbrook voters and Rainbow voters. It is plausible that maybe Rainbow voters say yes and Fallbrook voters say no. So what then happens? Well, that means that only uh, Fallbrook uh, would do the uh, boundary change and the Rainbow, if I was consistent, who's, uh, voters who said no, well, they would remain with uh, the Water Authority. Um, my name is Cindy Treesh, resident of Fallbrook. and. Um, Talking about the other San Diego County voters who may or may not be able to vote on this, is it dependent on LAFCO's decision, number one? And is when would we know whether other voters in Chula Vista, San Ysidro, wherever, would be able to vote on that? And then I have another question about LAFCO voting, the eight voting members. So uh, it has been requested by the Water Authority already that should LAFCO see fit to approve uh, one or both of these proposals, that one of the conditions be that we uh, require a vote of the entire Water Authority's jurisdiction. Uh, that's a question that ultimately would go uh, to Andy and the other seven voting members, uh, like other potential conditions. Okay, and those eight voting members, do they all have equal uh, voting rights or yes. percentages? Because it, it, well, anyway, that's a question. Doesn't seem quite kosher there. But anyway, um, and what's to say that Eastern won't raise their rates or their um, cost? Yeah, well, there's, uh, when you look at the Eastern's $11 a acre foot, it's been at that level for, I think, the last 15 years. And so, because they, all it is is for them to run the invoices. Since we're not using their pipelines and it's just coming through MET, it's just a, it's a small markup for them to do the administrative cost of, of uh, sending out the paperwork to invoices. So we don't expect that. They don't forecast any rate increase like that because there's no in, in additional cost to them them to raise the rates on us, they have to demonstrate there's new cost under Prop 26 and Prop 218. They have to do a cost of service study that would be required for that. I don't know, I don't know where the mic is. Oh, there's back there. Hi. <clears throat> First, I guess I have a comment for LAFCO, and then I have a question for the two boards. Um, there's going to be a possibility of LAFCO recommending an exit fee on this whole deal. And I would hope that if that happens, as this gentleman talked about before, it shouldn't happen at all. But if it does happen, uh, it shouldn't be so punitive to make this deal not worth voting for. And I'm hoping that LAFCO takes that into consideration. We will. Um, good. And the other question is, we've talked about this, and both boards are, I, I am way for this, and uh, both, both boards have talked about the money savings. But what tends to happen with government agencies is when they have more money all of a sudden to spend, they find ways to spend it. Will the two water boards find a way to commit to return some of the savings back to, the, to their rate payers in, in terms of a rate reduction? Now, I, I can speak only for Rainbow. In, in your uh, mailboxes coming pretty soon will be a rate hearing notice. And there's a graph in there that shows just that but it's, it's incumbent upon uh, us getting through the process, so. Um. And, and I'd say, I, I think for both our boards, there's nothing 
they would rather do than to be able to do a rate reduction after the last so many years. And, and just to remember, you know, the, the board members, you elect them and they're people you know um, within the community. So, you know, our, our board members, Charlie Walk, who's, who's back there, Don McDougall, Jennifer, um, Dave Baxter. So the, the key for them is to again hear from the residents. Um, and, and so they're, they're ultimately going to be the decision makers. What this gives them an, an option to do is to do it and do it and still be fiscally responsible, right? So they would love to do it every year, but they recognize if the cost of water is going up 8%, if we do a rate increase, we're going to go out of business fairly quick and have the state come and take us over. So that's, you know, that's their role is to do what they can on on rates, but they've also got to make sure they're doing it in a responsible way. But I I think they'll through this process, you know, have the chance to hear from people too and make sure that that does happen at the end. I'm getting there. Yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah. yeah hi, uh, Pete Cause uh, Bonsell. Uh, a couple of questions. I was wondering, it, it appeared that the legal um, requirements for withdrawing are, they seem to me to be pretty straightforward. Is that in fact the case? I yeah. mean, because it, it doesn't appear to me that uh, anybody could. There's, there's a couple of different facets here. In the County Water Authority Act, which was written around World War II, uh, and amended, this thing has been amended, but not very recently, um, a lot of the processes put in there predated the formation of LAFCOs. Uh, it was governor, uh, the first governor, Brown, not, not the second governor either his terms, his father, the father. Uh, the father, Edmund G. Brown, started them back in the late 60s. And so there's a different layer of analysis that goes in. And LAFCO, by and large, and I serve on one of their uh, advisory committees, um, does a lot of great work to try to streamline government. And some people say, hey, we need better government. LAFCO's main role is to streamline local government so we don't have overlapping and, and confusing jurisdictions. So the, the, the real trick comes into where LAFCO will then take the County Water Authority Act and its own statutes and interpret how those merge. You know, they're likely that we have a different opinion of how they merge than the Water Authority. That the Water Authority like and have a county-wide vote, they think that's an appropriate thing for LAFCO to do. We would counter that the Principal Act should overrule that and eliminate that. So this is something we have to go through a process. LAFCO staff does this for a living and, and the commissioners have heard uh, quite a few contentious things over the years. Uh, and so they'll, they'll, you know, they're gonna split the baby here somehow. We'll figure it out when we get there. Okay, and just one other quick thing. Uh, somebody said up there during the uh, presentation that the preponderance of the rate that we pay is for the water. Yep. Um, at least in Rainbow, it seems like it's a, uh, you know, uh, 150 bucks before you turn on a spigot. So yeah. Well, of of your of your bill, the vast majority of it goes for the purchased water. Some of the costs for the water we buy from the Water Authority are fixed. So we have millions and millions of dollars of fixed charge in the Water Authority. We pass those straight through uh, portion of, proportionally to our customers. That's part of the charges we want to knock off the bill, and so. Um, the challenge with water is that it was all free when it came out of the sky. It just gets real expensive to collect it from wherever it came from, move it through all the pipelines, treatment plants, pump stations to get here. And then the last mile to your houses in our in our region in Rainbow, if you lived out in, you know, in Gomez Creek somewhere or some places that are pretty darn remote, uh, it's amazing there's even pipelines there out in Duluth. And, and uh, the fact that we have water mains in some places is, is kind of amazing. It's more expensive per mile of pipe because there's fewer people. If you lived on a, a brownstone yeah. three-story walk up down in, in uh, normal heights and in one block, you've got more people that'll be in three or four miles of road here. So part of the benefit of living in the country and having six or 10 acres is to be in a country that has six or 10 acres, but you also carry more of the burden of the infrastructure. Our sure. 84 okay. miles, every bit of pipe is owned by the 8,000 customers we got. And that's all we got. Okay. Uh, Eastern's, uh, if we get water from Eastern and we're our own entity, it's going to be the same cost as if it goes the same. Or less. Less. There's a wholesale cost, and we're just buying, we're, we're looking at some of the pass through that's wholesale cost. Water authority is about 600. So that money that we save will be sure. able to be uh, passed down to you. But, and more importantly, 
we need to reinvest it here in our infrastructure here. In San Diego, sure. San Diego um, kind of like holds the purse strings for you. Or are they the ones who determine yeah. what you can purchase and what you can't? The Water Authority, the Water Authority Board of Directors is made up of the 24 member agencies. They set the budgets and rates. We vote no on them. They still pass them. We end up paying them. But, but in yeah. terms of the amount of water you can purchase. Um, there, there is no shutoff in the amount of water you purchase. You just would pay more. So metropolitan, if you got into shortages, they just you have a higher rate if you ever got into the allocations. But there's never a, you know, there, there's never been in the history of, of metropolitan where someone's been shut off. So there is no shut off between Water Authority, Metropolitan, Eastern. There's none that says, all right, this is how much water you get. You can't get any more than that. Okay, so, um, but I think the key point that I'm getting from this is that. Sooner or later, San Diego has used somewhere around 50 mil that we have paid in um, of our money, and we haven't gotten the benefit of that. And so it seems to me that any exit fee is ridiculous. Yeah, and that'll be a LAFCO. You know, that, yeah. that is our argument. Um, Certainly be a laugh. But, it'll be something okay. LAFCO will have to. Can you address you? Thank you. do you want to do the drawing real quick, and then we can yeah. finish up some questions? Because I know some people want to do Sure, and the odds look pretty good because i think some people have left yeah, and, and maybe what we can do, do is do the drawing and then you know tom and i will stick around if people have questions for us but we can maybe uh you know let others get out of this hot room and move okay on. hayden do you want to draw a name out let's have a hand for all these people that work together it looks like Trudy Cunningham. And these were donated by our board member, Dave Baxter and his wife, Stephanie. Do the other one. Bob and Sherry Drzewski. Zwicky. Mm, must be present to win. Okay, pick another one. All right. Are we, are we good with our drawing, Noel? We don't have any other. We're good with the drawing. I just wanted to point out that we have these comment cards like this, and they're in the foyer. Please feel free to fill them out. We take everything you say and consider it. It's important to us. You can also check off a box if you haven't already that indicates you want to receive updates. From yeah, us. so please, you know, any feedback is great for or against. Um, you know, any other thoughts is really helpful to us, uh, our board, who ultimately has to make a you know decision as we pursue this too. So really appreciate all your time for coming. And if you have other questions, Tom and I will be up here, but we'll let others get on with their evening. Thank you guys. And if you didn't get a sandwich, there are still some up front. Please help yourself. So do you want to do it personally and shut this off? Yeah, yeah you can just shut this off. Oh, go ahead. Questions. Go ahead. Uh, number.